The M4 Pro Mac Mini was without a doubt the best Apple device that I purchased last year, but as good as it is, that doesn't mean there's not one obvious flaw. Hi, my name's David and I make videos about Apple Gear every week here on the channel. Why? Because I use Apple Gear every day and I love talking to you about it. Now I've made a number of videos talking about the M4 Mac Mini and the M4 Pro Mac Mini and telling you how good it is to use. So I'm not going to repeat that in this video. There are other videos you can go and watch about that. No, I want to address that kind of the elephant in the room. The one issue that we've got with the M4 Mac Mini and that is storage. Now, the M4 Mac Mini starts off affordable. That's part of its USP. That's part of its appeal. It could be the first Mac you get into. The ticket price on the base model M4 Mac Mini is five, six hundred pounds. And for the M4 Pro Mac Mini, it's 1,400 pounds. So it's an appealing price point. Until that is, you start adding extras at the point of checkout. Now, as we're gonna be talking about my Mac, and if you haven't watched those other videos, I'm just gonna go quickly through the specs I've got on my Mac Mini here in the studio, the one that I work on all of the time, so we've got a reference point of where I'm at. I decided to go for the M4 Pro chip with the 14-core CPU and the 20-core GPU and, of course, the 16-core neural engine. I went for 48 gigs of memory, one terabyte of storage, which is what we're gonna be looking at closely in this video, and also, while I was at checkout, I decided to spend the extra 100 pounds on the 10 gigabit ethernet port as well. So that tidy little lot meant this Mac mini, this M4 Pro Mac mini sitting on my desk cost me 2,400 pounds. Now, most of the options when it comes to checkout are pretty self-explanatory. They, they kind of sort themselves out. The chip, you know what chip you're gonna need pretty much by the kind of work that you do. For me, I know that most of my work is video or audio editing and I spend a lot of time in Photoshop and Lightroom and I was hoping that this M4 Pro Mac Mini might replace my M1 Max MacBook Pro, which it has done, by the way. So I decided to go for the Pro chip. There was no question about that. Next was memory. Now, with memory, Apple Silicon is so efficient at the way it uses memory. I could have gone for 64 gigs of memory, but in the end, I went for 48, and that really hasn't been a problem. Then we come to storage. Now, storage is where we all start, start to double question ourselves and have self-doubts and understand why. You only get one chance to get the memory right on the Mac that you're buying. The purchase you're making today might well be lasting you five, six, seven, eight, ten years. You need to get it right. Now, in my case, I went for one terabyte, as I said to you, and I knew that was on the skinny side. I knew that wouldn't be enough long term, but equally, I'd kind of figured I spent enough with Apple on that given day. I was done. So I knew I had to begin to address the storage issue. Now, if you've watched any of my videos over the past few years, you'll know that I've always been an advocate of buying as much internal storage as you can. The reason was because it's always been the quickest and most convenient. And to some degree, that still holds true, but not as true as it once did. Now, there is also a downside to buying onboard or inbuilt storage on your Mac. Let's say your Mac goes down, it gets broken, it stops working, it gets stolen. Suddenly, if you haven't been very cautious about backing up all your data, you've lost everything. Clearly, if you've got an external SSD with most of your work on, that's not an issue. And also, of course, you can take that same SSD and you can work on different Macs. So what you lose in convenience you make up for more than make up for with flexibility and upgradability. Now I've bought a number of SSDs over the years, but I've never really given them that much thought. They were just to put some data on, maybe to put some data on to move between Macs, maybe they're backup or archives, but they, just, they were just a drive, they were just something. I never gave them much thought. And I realize now that was a mistake because not all SSDs are equal. I'm gonna try and talk you through the honest truth of what I've learned over the past few weeks with the M4 Pro Mac Mini and how I think I can possibly help you as well. Now, the first time I spent any real time looking at what I was buying with an SSD was when the iPhones got the USB-C port. As you may well know, I record every week to an SSD on the iPhone 16 Pro Max, and I need something that will mean I can record to it, maybe for 30, 40 minutes at a time, take the data off and get it over onto the Mac. When the iPhones came out, I noticed that they actually had a 10 gigabit per second transfer speed. So I spent a lot of time trying to find an external SSD that would work perfectly for the iPhone. In the end, I went for this, the Samsung T7 SSD, and it's been really, really good. It's never let me down. As I say, I've been called for reasonably long periods of time, and it works and it does its job perfectly in that case scenario. But just before Christmas, I found its breaking point. I found its weakness. And this is where I realized not all SSDs are the same. 
When I was making a video comparing the M4 Mac Mini and the M4 Pro Mac Mini, I was editing on both machines that week, so I needed to have the Final Cut file on an SSD, and the only one I had was a Samsung T7. Now, I noticed that Final Cut suddenly started juddering. I was struggling to edit. Of course, the M4 Mac Minis were new to me. I immediately thought it's the fault of the new Mac Mini, but it wasn't. It was a T7 SSD. It got hot, roasting hot, red hot, so much, in fact, that I had to wait for 45, 50 minutes for it to cool down before I could start editing. That's when I realized that I needed to think more carefully about what the future is going to be for my M4 Pro Mac Mini that I've decided to keep and use as my main working Mac if I was going to sort out this issue of storage long term. So it was at that point I decided to reach out to some other creators, people that I thought might be in the same position as myself and see what their solutions were, see what they were using. And one name kept cropping up, a cases. So I reached out to them and they sent me some devices to try. This isn't a sponsored video, they sent me the devices, but I'm giving you my own opinions of how I found these devices to use. Now, there's one particular device they sent me which really got my attention. It was a TB501 because it's saying that it's got that magical 80 gigs per second transfer data speed. It was ready to use on the M4 Pro Mac Mini. I could use, properly use, those Thunderbolt 5 ports on the back of my Mac for the first time. And I was really interested to see how that went. Now, when you buy the Acasis TB501, what you get is the enclosure. You get this case. It's up to you what memory you put in there. And understand the reason for that. It gives you complete control of what memory you want to buy, which make you prefer, and how much memory you want in there. Initially, I've gone for this two terabyte Samsung 990 Evo Plus, but of course, if I want to upgrade that, I can. Now, looking at costs, a lot of this comes down to costs. The actual TB501 costs about £250, $299, as I mentioned, and the memory cost me £140. So I've spent £390. If you compare that to the price of Apple and two terabytes from them, it's £600. So I've made a really good saving of £200. In fact, that saving is almost enough for me to go and buy four terabytes of this same Samsung memory that I've got in this drive at the moment. So the savings are considerable. But of course, the savings only mean something if it's actually usable. And that's what we're gonna kind of begin looking at a little bit later on in this video. And by the way, I mentioned that I've got more devices to try. There's more Apple gear coming out. And if you're enjoying this channel, the big thing you can do to help me out is subscribe. It really does help the channel out grow. It means that these videos get put in front of more people each week, new faces each week. And the more subscribers we get, the more viewers we get, the quicker the channel grows and the more content I can bring you. So if you are enjoying these videos each week that I bring you, do me a favor, just hit that subscribe button. Honestly, it really matters. And while you're doing it, it's a one and done turn on notifications as well. So every time I upload a video, you're one of the first to know. Now I'm brand new to these enclosures. I didn't really know what I was getting into when I started to unbox it. But the great thing of this Acasis TB501, I don't know what other enclosures are like. I don't really care. I'm, I'm talking about this one. Is it's so simple to use. There's no tools needed. You just pop the top off, put the memory in. It's really easy to insert, put a heat sink strip on and you are done. Connect it up to the Mac. There's no external power source. It's just the one Thunderbolt 5 cable powers everything up. It's really, really simple to set up and get going with. That said, I did get an error message come up on screen, first thing when I put it in, saying that the disk wasn't readable. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's not sinister. All it means is that the memory straight out of the box isn't formatted for Mac or for Windows. And all you need to do on a Mac is open up Disk Utility, highlight the drive that you want, and then from the drop down, choose the APFS, the Apple File System. It's journaled and it's efficient and it's designed for modern SSDs as well. If you need to use this drive with Windows and Mac, you could try using the XFAT format. Now, I've got used to working in an Apple Silicon environment over the last four years, which means I've got used to working totally silently. Now, there is the faintest murmur, literally a tickle of a sound that you hear when it's on tick over, I've noticed from the Acasis TB501 but it really isn't much at all. It is so, so quiet that it wouldn't interfere with your day's work. So we've kind of got as far as a setup. Then I had to think about how to actually show you what this is like to use. Now I could use thermometer tests. I could make this full of clickbait. I could do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, but that's not how I like to review things for you. I think you come here for honest reviews of products that you might want to go and buy. And by the way, if you do want to buy one of these, I say this isn't a paid video, but it is a link in the description, if you decide to buy one of these drives, it really would help support the channel out. But anyway, how can I show you what this is like to use? As much as I don't like benchmarks, I'm going to use the Blackmagic Design Disk Speed Test. 
I'm going to use the five gig test that they've got in there. And the reason for that is that these figures actually mean something. We're just basically looking at speeds. We're literally comparing speeds. So I'm going to look at the speed of the Apple SSD that's built into my M4 Pro Mac Mini. We're going to look clearly at the Casey Samsung drive that I've got here. And also out of interest at that T7, which will clearly be the slowest just to see what speeds we get out of that. Then the only other meaningful thing I could really do was a drag and drop test. So I've got a seven gig movie file, .mov file on my desktop, and I'm gonna drag that onto the Acasis and onto the T7. And I think you'll be amazed at the difference in speeds there. Honestly, it was amazing how quick it went on to the Acasis drive, but we'll get to that in a little bit. And then the main crux of what I'm gonna do in this video, I'm gonna take all the files I'm recording out from the Canon, from the, iPhone 16 Pro Max, I'm recording in ProRes Log, that file will be huge, that'll be 80, 90 gigs, I can promise you, plus the audio I'm recording in Audition. I'm gonna take all of these files, all of the B-roll files, put them onto a folder on the Acasis drive, and I'm gonna edit this entire video from the Acasis drive. So if I come back in a couple of days time, telling you I've had a great result, we'll know that it's a genuine saving that's gonna be made. But before we get into editing, let's just begin looking at some numbers of what I found so far when I've done some disk speed tests. So looking at the numbers that we were getting from that disk speed test, first of all, the Acasis enclosure, I was getting read write speeds there around about 5,700 megabits per second, both read and write, running these tests about 10 or 12 times to make sure I'm getting a fairly average mean reading. Then if we look at Apple's SSD inside the M4 Pro Mac Mini, there I was getting fractionally faster write speeds of 6,700 megabits per second and slower read speeds of 5,000 megabits per second. And lastly, the T7, which we knew was gonna be slower, there I was getting 870 megabits per second write speeds and 720 megabits per second read speeds. And moving that file, moving that seven gig movie file off of the desktop onto the T7 or onto the Acasis drive, there was a massive difference. On Acasis website, they say you can move a six gig file in a second, and I'm willing to believe that now. That seven gig file took about a second and a half to two seconds. It was so quick. It was the blink of an eye. Whereas when I went to drag it on to the Samsung T7, that took almost 10 seconds. And just to give you some reference here, I bought this RAID about four years ago for backing up a lot of the archive footage I've got here in the studio. It was state of the art back then. It's only four or five years old and look at the box. It says lightning speeds of 20 gigabits per second. And here we are now in 2025 with Thunderbolt 5 and we're 80 gigabits per second. I wondered why that raid seemed very slow. Now I know. So with the figures done, it's time I leave you for a little while, go and edit the video and come back in a couple of days time and let you know how I've got on. As promised now, back wrapping up, giving you my final thoughts on what's been going for the last day and a half, I guess I've been using it. The only time it's been unplugged from the M4 Pro Mac Mini was when I had to do some B-roll shots today uh, and for the thumbnail. And then also today for time, I had it plugged into the M1 Max MacBook Pro and it still worked fine there. Of course, not on Thunderbolt 5 speeds, but it still worked fine. And that is part of the beauty I was talking about earlier on with the flexibility between Macs it is seamless. Honestly, I would recommend it to you. Now, I didn't know what to expect coming into this. I'd never used an enclosure before. I'd never bought memory before. This was all new to me, but it is, is as if I'm working off of the M4 Pro Mac Mini. It is seamless, it's quick, and it's quiet as well. I mean, I mentioned that noise early on in the video. It's such a quiet little hum. You honestly wouldn't notice it. And I'm fussy, believe me, I'm particular. And, and I didn't notice it. It's really, really quiet and barely gets warm. Now I've been editing off of this pretty solidly now for a day and a half, and it, it's no warmer than the M4 Pro Mac Mini. Honestly, there's nothing to be concerned about with, with throttling or temperatures. It stayed cool. It's quiet, it's quick to work from, it offers you the flexibility and the speed is tremendous as well. If you might have seen, I took that 130 gig movie file to really push it and that took 26 seconds from the desktop over onto the Acasis drive. It is really quick. The, the best praise I can give it is by telling you probably before the week's out, I'm gonna buy four terabytes for it. That's how good it is, maybe even eight. Um, that way I've got on the desktop there, plenty of storage, plenty of quick memory to use. I can drag the, the video projects onto it every week, leave the M4 Pro Mac Mini as free as possible. It is the solution I've been looking for. Yes, eventually I might go the NAS drive. So there is a possibility that I'll utilize a 10 gig port on the back of the Mac Mini at some point and go the NAS drive route. But for now, this is the solution. I'm really happy with it. And I think what I'll probably do is end up taping the hard drive to the back of the desk out of sight so that everything's clean and tidy. 
it's easy then just to pull the desk if I need to. As you saw, it's really easy to change the memory inside of it. But if I buy eight terabytes, I'm not needing to be going behind there anytime soon. That will last me for a long, long time. So honestly, hand on heart, I can tell you, if you're looking for a storage solution, this a case is TB501, the Samsung drive I've got inside of it, that memory I've got inside of it, it's a real working solution. Don't forget, if you are thinking of buying one of these and you want to help support the channel and all the work I do here, there is an affiliate link in the description. It would just help me a little bit if you decide to buy to go through that. And I'll also leave a link for the Samsung memory that I bought as well. So if you want to click on that, it just helps support the channel. But this has been the solution that I've been looking for. And if you want to carry on looking at Mac minis and my thoughts of Mac minis, I'll leave that video on screen right now of when I compared the M4 Mac Mini and the M4 Pro Mac Mini.